Live from the Intel Museum in Santa Clara, California, welcome to a special edition of Bloomberg West, Intel from the inside. I'm Emily Chang. Over the next hour, we will take you inside a company that's led the technology revolution for four and a half decades with the utmost goal of making chips smaller, faster, and more powerful so your electronics can be smaller, faster, and more powerful. We'll bring you exclusive interviews with Intel CEO Paul Odolini, COO Brian Krasanich, and head of mobile Mike Bell. We will also show you just how this company puts the Intel inside all your gadgets. Intel processors run 80% of the world's PCs and most of its servers as well. We will give you a glimpse also of the future of the brave new world of computing, according to Intel. But first, here are some of the other top stories we are following at this hour. Facebook is boosting the price range for its IPO. The new range is $34 to $38 a share, up from $28 to $35 a piece. At the high end, that means the company could have a market value of $104 billion, which would top the market caps of companies as big as McDonald's and Citigroup. Facebook plans to stop taking orders for its IPO today. Sources tell Bloomberg Facebook is looking for new directors who can add diversity to its board. At least one woman is expected to be named to the all-male board. The social network is working with recruiting firm Spencer Stewart to identify possible new members. Facebook has come under fire for the lack of women and independent directors on the board. No announcement is expected, though, until after Facebook goes public. And spending on social media advertising may be ready to skyrocket. Researcher BIA Kelsey predicts spending could rise to nearly $10 billion this year, up from just under $4 billion last year. The reason? Higher ad spending at LinkedIn and YouTube, as well as strong growth in social video. Now, back to our special Intel from the inside. We will be joined by Intel CEO Paul Odolini in a moment, but first, as we often do on Bloomberg West, we want to take a look at the numbers behind this company. Let's head to our editor at large, Corey Johnson, with a special Intel drill down. Well, in the drill down, we look at the company news behind a stock on the move. And a stock on the move over the long term, the big picture with Intel. Over the last decade, this stock hasn't done much. It's been a story that doesn't look like much. If you look at the return of the stock, compare that to the S&P 500. S&P 500 up 22% in the last decade. Intel down. But that doesn't tell you the story of how much change has actually happened right here at Intel headquarters here in Santa Clara, California. So if you look at the revenue growth for this company, just on a snapshot, an annual basis, look at the, the revenue growth we've seen. In 2001, the company doing what seemed like a lot, 26.5 uh, $26 billion dollars in revenues. Look at last year, 54 billion in revenues. That's some substantial growth. What about profits? Profits have also grown, uh, grown quite a bit. Again, uh, quite in contrary to the stock price, we've seen profits grow from a billion three annually, which seemed like a lot. The net income of nearly 13 billion dollars last year. But the reason we really care about Intel is because. In spite of taking all that profit in the company, in spite of all the revenues the company has managed to garner over those years, the company is sitting at the precipice of some massive change. Tremendous investments in capital expenditures, and we're going to talk about those later on in the show. The big investments in CapEx have put this company in position to really lap the competition if it all works. Much thinner chips, yeah, that's been the story about Intel for as long as Intel has existed, uh, 40 years and going, then, then some. But when you look at the evolution of the next set of chips from Intel, it could put the company in a whole other category of chip design, unlike all of their competitors, not just in the PC market, but giving them the ability to expand into places where they've struggled, into mobile, into other kinds of devices. Intel's at the precipice of some massive, massive change. And if this stuff works, if they've found the keys to the kingdom, Intel 10 years from now could be an entirely different company than we've seen over the course of the last 10 years. Emily? Thanks, Corey. Now, as Intel has propelled the evolution of chips and computers, our first guest has been there nearly every step of the way. Paul Odolini first joined Intel back in 1974. He's managed several Intel businesses from PCs to global sales, and he's risen up through the ranks to become president and CEO. He's just the fifth chief executive in Intel's 44-year history, 
a testament to the company's long-term stability in the fast-changing technology industry. He is also on the board of Google. With me now live, Intel CEO Paul Odellini in an exclusive interview. Thanks so much for joining us, oh, You're Paul. welcome. So under your management, Corey was talking about it earlier, but Intel had a record sales and profit year last year, on track to do it again. How do you keep that kind of growth up? Well, you, you, you have the right products at the right time. It's, it's a simple uh, model here, but our whole view of the world is, is that we have to you know, replace our existing products every year. Uh, we have to invent new things every year, otherwise people are going to just stay with what they have. They'll have, why, why, why replace your computer if it never gets better? So our view is new products, new markets, uh, new users uh, day in and day out. And in technology, especially, the markets are constantly shifting. Obviously, PC is still a huge part of your business. Analysts predicting growth in the PC market to slow down. So where do you see the growth coming from, given your look at the future? Well, the PC market's still pretty good. I think it's, people have been predicting its death for 20 years, and it continues to grow. It's approaching half a billion units a year. Uh, at that kind of size, everything slows down. Uh, so the percent growth is, is, is in fact not what it was 10 years ago, but it's still pretty darn good. And our view is that particularly as emerging markets, uh, as people in emerging markets have more disposable income, more connectivity options, getting a PC is very often the first thing a family thinks about in terms of education or upward mobility. And there's been some changing dynamics in the emerging markets as well. China is now the number one PC market, U.S. number two, Brazil number three. But, but looking out over the next few years, you actually see some changes. Well, we see, we see Russia and, and India coming on the top five list as well. Uh, I think the U.S. will remain number two. Um, and, and that really reflects our view of uh, the, the, the combination of the emerging markets uh, income growth at the individual level and the need for what computers do. Computers are not just you know, things that replace typewriters anymore. These are intrinsic tools for your job, for your education, for your work, for your fun. Uh, for your connection to your family as, as families are more dispersed. They really are indispensable today. And you're actually a big proponent of this new Ultrabook tablet hybrid. You've called it the next big thing. Why do you say that? Well, I, I think it is um, a revolution um, because it, it takes mobile computing to the next stage. You know, we, we changed the nature of what, what it meant to have a notebook in 2003 when we invented Centrino which brought Wi-Fi to the masses, to the world. We enabled the world for Wi-Fi and allowed all of us to be able to connect sort of everywhere you go. What Ultrabook is going to do is give you um, uh, a similar kind of change in terms of the way you use computers. More powerful, thinner, longer battery life, but more importantly, start bringing in capabilities for the way humans and machines interact with each other. Voice, perceptual, gestures will all start coming into the PC for the first time. And now with touch uh, being enabled in a mainstream operating system from Microsoft uh, with Windows 8, I think that an, an is yet another big breakthrough. You start putting these together into very powerful, uh, nicely priced packages, and I think you're going to see a lot of excitement around them. Now, Intel is inside Apple computers. Apple CEO Tim Cook, though, has a different approach to this. He doesn't think, he has said, he doesn't think these Ultrabook tablet hybrids are going to work, that they're sticking with the iPad. How, how do you respond to that? Well, t Tim's comment was, you know, crossing a toaster and a refrigerator doesn't work very well. Uh, and one of our customers had, I, th I thought, a better retort to that than I'll ever come up with, which he said was, that's not what we're doing. You know, the, the combination of a toaster and an oven into a toaster oven worked pretty well. And that's really what we're aiming at here. We're trying to find the best of both worlds, the uncompromised creative capability of a PC and that very simplistic consumption model that a tablet gives you. There's no reason for people to call, carry two, two devices around anymore or spend twice as much money because you need both. You need a left brain experience and a right brain, brain experience. Windows 8 also coming up later this year. That's going to be huge for you. You're also going to be facing a whole new slate of competitors like Qualcomm, TI, NVIDIA, they sell chips more ch cheaply than you, so, so how do you compete with that? Well, they actually don't sell chips more cheaply than we do. We sell chips at the, the price point of, of, the, uh, of those ARM-based vendors, uh, so that's not, that's not a, uh, anything new to us. Um, and, and if the world wanted cheap computers, our average selling price would be a lot less than it is today. These are expensive investments. People want these multi-hundred dollar investments to last for many, many years, and they, they tend to buy the very best, and they, they want real 
performance and productivity out of these machines. We will always have an advantage in performance and productivity, in my, in my view. Secondly, this is not the first time we face competition. We've just, it's just the latest it's only round. Been 44 it's just the, years, right? No, 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 no. It's the latest round of competition. We've, you know, we, we fought the risk cis battles 20 years ago. We fought, uh, we've had AMD as a long-term competitor. Uh, Texas Instruments used to be in the market against us, and other companies have come and gone. But for the most part, we've done a good job because we consistently advance the value proposition that end users need. All right, Paul, stick around. We'll be right back with you after the break. Intel has more than an 80% market share for personal computers, but when it comes to smartphones, that market share drops to near zero. So what is Intel's strategy for moving into mobile? We'll have more with Intel CEO Paul Odellini next. And later, from the friends who decided to start a memory chip company back in the late 1960s to the invention of the microprocessor, we go back to the beginning for Intel. All of that on this special edition of Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang, and this is a special edition of Bloomberg West, Intel from the inside. We are live at the Intel Museum in Santa Clara, California. Intel continues to dominate the PC market, but it's just now breaking into the smartphone arena. So what is next? We are back now with an exclusive interview with Intel CEO Paul Odellini. Let's talk first about gross margins. Yours are some of the most impressive in the industry, more than 60%. So as your mobile business grows, how does that impact margins? Our mobile business being the, the phone business? Right. Uh, I don't think it'll change the, the, the Intel margins that much. Uh, you know, we're certainly, uh, as you pointed out in your teaser, uh, we're zero percent share today. Uh, we have ambitions to be very large here. But our view is that these markets may be lower priced, but not necessarily lower margin. Uh, we, have a, we have the world's best cost structure. We think we can bring the best bang for the buck in, into, the, into these capabilities. And we also think that we can bring um, incremental revenue in mobile through services, through value-added services. For example, McAfee you know, sells a security package that, that uh, end users can buy for, I think, 30 bucks for three years. That alone, that annuity stream would, would you know, substantially improve the margins as a percent uh, in, in mobile space. So it's an important space. We'll have a very high performance uh, set of products but at very, very low cost. Now, you've made a string of announcements in mobile lately. You're in a new phone out in India, partnerships with Lava, ZTE in China, France Telecom, Lenovo, Motorola. At what point do you see, in terms of your own timeline, mobile being a truly meaningful part of your business? Well, we don't, I don't think about it that way, and I don't talk about it that way. What I'm looking at in the early stages are the key design wins. How good are our products? What's our product roadmap? How well are we executing? Which companies are committing? Uh, you know, and, and we'll look at that a year from now and decide and look at the volume curve associated with it. Obviously, we have projections. But to me, the most important thing in our first year in the market is, is who we're doing business with and how good are the products. In terms of the who, the, the France Telecom deal was interesting in that you made the deal directly with the service provider. Are we going to see more well, of those types uh, of deals? The one in India is as well. Okay. Uh, Lava is, is, is a so service provider. So a couple provider. of these deals. I think now. you'll, yeah, and we're not, uh, we're not biased in any particular direction on the, on the business model. Uh, some customers would prefer to buy uh, reference designs that they put their own skins on and put their own user interface on and, and have a, an offering directly to um, their stores. Um, other, other customers like, like Motorola uh, you know, are a classic um, uh, OEM manufacturer that wants to buy chips from us and, and integrate and add their own value to it. We're, we're agnostic. Uh, we like both models. They both sell chips and they're both solid sets of customers. You mentioned Motorola. You're on the board of Google as well. How do you see Google's acquisition of Motorola impacting your partnerships and other partnerships? Well, I, I was actually not involved in the uh, board discussions around Motorola. I, I recused myself for that. Uh, so I really can't answer that question, except to say that Motorola is a you know, very strong uh, global player. Uh, their brand is perhaps one of the best worldwide for mobile phones. They're exceptionally strong in China. And those are markets that we care about. So what kind of mobile announcements can we expect to see from Intel coming down the pike? What should we be watching for? Um, new customers and new products. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the culture of Intel. You know, we're here at the Intel Museum. Intel's been known for a long, long time for, for its sort of 
rigid culture. Now, as you expand into a new product lineup, how do you see that culture evolving, and is that culture of Intel's past still important today? Well, the, the culture is important. The history, the traditions of the company are certainly important to, to us and to me personally. Um, but uh, I take a, a bit of an issue with your use of the word rigid. Uh, I think our culture's changed. All companies change. I mean, right. the, the intel of today is not the intel of 1974. Well, the workforce of today is not the workforce of 1974. It's evolved. It's gotten us into new areas. For example, software. You know, software, when I joined the company, was not a big part. I, I don't know if we had any software engineers. Today, we, ha we are like the second or third largest software company in the world as measured by the number of engineers going into, into that area. So, so it really is, uh, you add different capabilities for different points in, in, in a company's history. You were actually Andy Gross' personal assistant, and, and he, at for least as time. I understand it, and you would of course know better, he was sort of known for his confrontational style and encouraging other people to manage that way, the kind of, you know, bang your fist on the table. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, and, and, and I, like I said, that was the 70s and 80s. This is not the 70s and 80s. Uh, the company is much bigger. Uh, the workforce has changed, and so you, you don't. You know, we're, we're equally uh, rigid about um, you know d d making commitments, meeting them, you know, being exceptional in our products. You're going to talk to our technologists in a few minutes. Um, the very nature of what we do for a living is an exact science. Our, our factories are cleaner than anywhere on earth. Our products have to be more precise than anything that human beings have ever built before. So the nature of what we do for a living requires a level of exactitude that doesn't exist in other industries or any other companies. And so, you know, that, that gives us a, a degree of rigidity, to use your word, that I think other companies don't have to have. On the other hand, we try to make it fun to work here. We try to attract the best and the brightest. We try to reward them. We want people to have good and fun jobs and to have a meaningful life outside of work. Now, moving on to the question of your successor, um, you were CEO, COO at one point became CEO, Craig Barrett, COO became CEO Brian Krasanich, who we'll be speaking with later in the program, is now COO. Is he in the position to, to be your successor? Well, he's one of a, a strong stable of candidates. Uh, you know, we're a company that's always gone from within in terms of these promotions. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense for most companies, particularly given the track record in the Valley lately. So we can expect this promotion uh, I, I, to come from within. I, I, would ho I would certainly hope so, and that's what I'm working for. My job is to, is to, is to groom a whole, you know, handfuls of people that the board can look at uh, to be able to evaluate and, and say, you know, this is the, this is the person. I want to ask you one last question about Facebook. It's scheduled to go public this week at a potential $104 billion valuation. Intel has survived many decades. You have been here for a very long time. You've seen lots of things. Do you think there's a bubble, or do you think that that's a fair number? Oh, I'm not going there. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a market person in general, laissez-faire market person. So if the market thinks it's worth $104 billion, it by definition is at that moment in time. The issue is what does the market think it's worth a year from now, five years from now. That's what, that's what tests companies. And we'll see if Facebook stands that test of time. Intel CEO Paul Odellini, thanks so much for joining us on You're this special edition of the show and for having us here at the museum. Today. You're welcome, Emily. Now, coming up, from memory chips to microprocessors, adding machines to personal computers, we look back at how it all began at Intel more than 40 years ago. And Intel's production facilities are a point of pride for the company, with the chip maker pumping more than $12 billion into the so-called fabs. Just this year, the man in charge is COO Brian Krasanich. We sit down with him. All of that and more coming up on this special edition of Bloomberg West, Intel from the Inside. This is Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. We are back live at the Intel Museum in Santa Clara, California. All around us here are relics of innovations past, inventions that help change the way we live and do business. And our senior West Coast correspondent, John Ehrlichman, is here with more on the history behind Intel and what a history it is. Yeah, and there's always been this debate in the industry. Uh, who's responsible for computers getting sold? Is it the computer makers or is it the Intel technology that powers those computers? And Paul Adelini was talking to you about evolving. Let's go back to the beginning to fully understand that story. 
year was 1968. The place, Mountain View, California. Two men decide to leave their current jobs, put up $250,000 a piece of their own money, and found a memory chip company. And they're led by this naturally um, charismatic character, a born leader named Bob Noyce. And also in that mix is a brilliant, brilliant uh, scientist physicist named Gordon Moore out of Caltech. And their first hire, a guy named Andy Grove. And that created the Troika. That was the birth of, of Intel Corporation. Journalist and author Michael Malone knows Intel inside and out. He's been covering Silicon Valley for more than 25 years and has written over a dozen books on high tech. Intel is really the product of two events. One of them is the semiconductor revolution, which they're the leader of. But they were also the product of a point of transition in the history of Silicon Valley. And what nobody was noticing was that there were a bunch of guys with, you know, crew cuts and skinny ties sitting out here in Northern California. We went from adding machines, you know, crank, crank adding machines, to electrical adding machines, and now we've gone to electronic adding machines. But they were still pretty big. And so they came to Intel and said, every one of these calculators has a big motherboard full of all these logic chips and memory chips and I.O. chips and all that. Can you figure out a way to make it smaller, reduce the number of chips? And they came up with a four-chip design. That's the invention of the microprocessor. Soon, co-founder Gordon Moore's idea that the number of transistors on a circuit could double every two years would become Moore's Law and set a frantic pace of innovation at Intel. Moore's Law basically says the chip industry agrees to provide the world with a new generation of chips that are about twice as powerful every couple years. Intel was the brains, the, the microprocessor at the center. And every time a new generation of Intel microprocessors came out, it made the previous generation cheaper. A device that cost $1,000 one year, two years later, would only cost 500 and then two years after that, 250 And that change has influenced a whole new generation of tech companies born since. Without Intel driving uh, the devices forward, none of the rest of the stuff you see, you know, from Facebook to Cisco to, you know, the iPad to Android phones, none of those things would exist without Intel driving the microprocessor forward. And you're actually going to be speaking with Mike Bell later in the program. He's got a really important job, head of mobile. The head of mobile, a former Apple guy, and I'll build on some of those questions you asked Paul Odolini because he's got almost a startup team within Intel. Really interesting stuff. Looking forward to that. The market they certainly need to move fast no into. Thanks, John. Now, Intel CEO Paul Odolini is the fifth CEO in the company's more than 40-year history, but he's also the third CEO who held the COO position first. We have an exclusive interview next with the man who holds the COO position now. Welcome back to a special edition of Bloomberg West, live from the Intel Museum in Santa Clara, California. We'll talk about the future of computing and how Intel is defining that future in just a moment. But first, here's a check of your Bloomberg Top Headline. More signs of strong demand for Facebook's IPO. The company is raising the target price of shares in its IPO to $34 to $38 a piece, up from $28 to $35 a share. That means the company could have a market cap of more than $104 billion once it goes public. Meanwhile, we are learning that General Motors plans to stop advertising on Facebook after executives determined the ads had little impact on consumers. The former head of News Corp's British newspapers has been charged in that controversial phone hacking scandal. Rebecca Brooks is facing three counts of conspiring to obstruct justice. Prosecutors say she helped hide documents and computers from investigators as they were looking into the phone hacking scandal last year. Her husband and four others were also charged. Brooks, who is a close friend of News Corp head Rupert Murdoch, is vowing to fight. And first there was a movie about Facebook. Now there's going to be a sitcom about Groupon. CBS has just ordered a pilot of a new show called Friend Me. It follows two guys who move from Indiana to Los Angeles to start working at Groupon. Superbad's Christopher Mintz Class and Red State's Nicholas Braun will star. Groupon has previously said it has no involvement in the show. 
And we continue now with our special intel from the inside, an intimate look behind the scenes of a company that has been at the forefront of tech and innovation for more than 40 years. For a look at what could be next from Intel, we are joined again by our Bloomberg West editor at large, Corey Johnson. Corey. Well, there's always this question about why people love technology, why it inspires them, and why they're willing to pay so much as investors for it. I think a big part of that is imagining their future, and no company has to worry about that as much as Intel has to worry about what will happen in their future. Predicting the future is hard. Nonetheless, predicting the future is Genevieve Bell's job. In a tiny lab tucked away in an Oregon engineering building, Bell has assembled an eclectic team to tell Intel just what the future will look like in technology. And we've had this incredible mix at Intel of research social scientists, the people like me, anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists, and we've married that with interaction design and industrial design and then with engineering. This isn't pie in the sky junk. It takes Intel a decade to design a new chip. So Intel's futurist is planning for right now. The key, she says, is not imagining what tech can do, but imagining what people want. What do people love and what are they going to love? And how do we make that possible? Intel looks at the Ultrabook, super sleek, fast, cool looking, as a place where the computer form and function follow the work of the Intel futurists. Now they're trying to top themselves. And we're looking at what's the next generation of Ultrabooks like? What's the next generation of phones like? What will the music and entertainment experience be like when it's not just on your phone or your tablet, but it's spread across all of those devices? Interestingly, these predictions don't always lead directly to new Intel-powered PCs. Rather, they lead to a brave new world where Intel products are at its center. We think that ultimately consumers want multiple devices in their lives. They'll, they'll, they'll have a smartphone, they'll have a tablet, and they'll have an Ultrabook. Consumers generally prefer more choices, not less. Technology changes faster than people change, but Bell is noticing a profound change in the acceptance of new technology, even if people don't get everything they want when they want it. I'm still waiting for my jetpack. Oh, you're never going to get it. I'm really sorry. Well, uh, keeping a company like Intel moving, understanding all the pieces of Intel, that's hard work for anyone, least of all the guy that has to do it. Uh, Brian Crescentis, Chief Operating Officer uh, here at Intel. You're known as BK around here. That's right. Even though I can take a stab at your last name. <laughs> what, what is the hardest job of all the hard jobs of, of keeping the trains running on time at Intel? You know, I, I think it's the, the daily shipments. We ship roughly about a million units a day. And you think about all the customers and all the places in the world that has to go to and the complexity of this technology. And you're trying to do that a million times a day. A million's a lot, but when you try and do a million every day, that, that gets to be a lot. And I was up at your uh, fab up in Oregon, and, and I, I was really struck by the volume of it, by the, the size. I know these are big, giant buildings, but I guess I, in my mind, I always imagined it was just like a, a big, giant stamp that stamps a single uh, wafer and moves on to the next one. But it, it, the, the volume of the process and the, and the successful yields that you have, in other words, the chips that aren't screwed up, has is, is got to be the biggest challenge there in terms of quantity. Yeah. I mean, there's about 500 steps that goes into making any wafer or any product. And, and, and you're right. Yield is one of the most important things we focus on. It really helps us deliver product every day. It drives our costs down. It's really a differentiator in this industry. Well, I think that people uh, you know, from the outside don't really understand how important yield is in terms of, you know, a screwed up chip is, is, is part of the process of making chips, but you don't want to have too many. What's the, when you get into a new process, what's the acceptable worst yield you're willing to sort of roll out with? Yeah, I, I can't give you the exact percentages. That's one of those inside secrets. Okay. But we spend a lot. Well, we of, are inside. Yeah, but, that's yeah. true. But you know, we spend a lot of time really focusing on. You know, each time you bring a new technology together, you're really looking at everything is smaller. And think about as things get smaller, the things that can kill it, that will ruin that image, can go smaller, and they're more important. And so. Smaller and smaller means smaller and smaller things become important, and we have to go manage those things. And that's really what we focus on as we bring a new technology. Is there, is there any pace of innovation that's too fast? Well, the answer you know, might be no. I don't know the answer. You know, I, I guess it depends on how you answer it. Uh, if, if you take a look at it, we bring technologies together every two years and bring them out. We bring new products roughly every year. 
we think that's about as fast as the industry and the consumer and everybody can absorb these things. And, and, and so we think that's about right. But Am I right to look at the decoupling of the sort of Wintel? There's still obviously a very important partnership, Microsoft and, and Intel's next great uh, PC chip. But it seems that there's so many other things happening in the world of technology and semiconductor design that there isn't the sort of every other year um, massive step change that used to be in technology even 10 years ago. Well, no, I'm not so sure about that. If you take a look at it, every year we're introducing a new technology. We introduced 22 nanometer technology this year. Two years from now, we'll introduce 14 nanometer technology. There will be a series of products that are introduced that will bring lots of new innovations. Uh, you know, Paul talked about earlier, uh, we'll bring you know, touch to PCs, we'll bring uh, perceptual computing, right. all of those things. All of those take technology, and all of those take those technologies will be generating over the next couple of years. But you still see those as very much coupled with the, the Windows evolutions in the same sort of time frame? Well, Windows is an important part of it. It's not the only thing that adds to it, but you know, you really have to bring the silicon, the software, and the hardware all together into one finished product, and so it's an important part. Intel has tended to be at least one step ahead of its competitors for most of the last, let's call it, 20 years, picking that randomly. Um, but it seems that in this new sort of three-dimensional uh, chip design in the 14 nanometer that you might be more ahead of competitors. How far ahead of competitors do you think you're, I, I don't know how to evaluate this, but you probably do. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, we, we've been looking at it. If you look at the last really new innovation we brought out, which was at 45 nanometers, it took competitors about three to three and a half years to catch up. Uh, this new technology, as you said, the three-dimensional transistor, we don't know, right? We think it'll be at least that long, maybe longer this time for them to be able to produce. They've kind of said it's about three or four years. We'll see. I mean, so, we have it. So, so let's take that. Does a longer time frame then give you, what extra advantage does that give you? Each one of these technologies brings a couple of things. They bring usually a performance, so you can add more features, more capability to your computing. They lower power, and they make things smaller, so you can put more transistors in the same space. So all of those bring uh, a combination of performance, power, and, and uh, cost advantage to Intel. So last thing, uh, you know, as, as you're in a role, of, important role of leadership here, what do you think is that we're going to talk about Intel culture in just a little bit in the show, and I wonder what you think of when you think of the Intel culture, the, the thing that's unique about Intel in the Valley that you really want to make sure continues at Intel. You know, I, I think what separates Intel from many companies that I interface with is we do what we say. When we say we're going to go deliver a product, when we say we're going to deliver a technology, it's there, and it can be usually counted on with a high confidence. Keeping your word, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, BK, thank you very much for joining us here thank at Inside Intel. It. We're going to talk more about Intel's culture right here from Inside Intel when the Intel from the inside continues. Welcome back. I'm Emily Chang. We are live at the Intel Museum at Intel headquarters in Santa Clara, California. One thing you pick up quickly here is that Intel chips work fast, really fast. We sent our senior West Coast correspondent John Ehrlichman on a tour of the museum to bring back some tidbits. You know, I like coming to the museum. I can take my time with some of these fancy concepts, like the fact that an Intel chip can communicate billions of instructions in one second. So they've got something that I think kind of looks like whack-a-mole to give you a better idea of how fast we're talking. Something that measures nanoseconds. You go, whew, not a bad score. 34 million nanoseconds to go across that. To, to, to get you to the point that in that amount of time, that Intel chip is working hard. And these chips are tiny, by the way. Here's a little more context. Here's the size of an Intel dual-core processor. Um, in real life, this is the size of a pencil eraser right down here. But if you want to get even fancier, and we can, we'd like to get fancy on Bloomberg West, we'll show you portion of this chip which is the size of a human hair or you want to go a little closer in because you can thanks to Intel here this portion which is the size of a red blood cell so I think one of the takeaways here is it's kind of cool to look at life in terms of nano and by the way if I measure my height in nanometers I get up to 1.8 billion not bad especially versus Corey Johnson I don't know he'd be off the charts Emily back to you <laughs> thanks John well, the heart of Intel's mission is Gordon Moore's so-called law, which says the number of transistors on a chip will double every two years as the price is cut in half. 
It is a daily inspiration at Intel, but that doesn't happen without a Herculean effort and a culture to support it. Our Corey Johnson got a look at that culture firsthand on a visit to Intel's fab in Oregon. Intel is a weird place and a place where wonderful things happen. And the Intel culture is first and foremost a place dominated by engineers. Mark Bohr is a legend at Intel, holder of 73 patents, author and co-author of 49 published papers, a 34-year veteran of Intel, an engineer's engineer. I think you love uh, working with a group of other very bright engineers, coming to work every day and being able to work with a very intelligent group of uh, people. At Facebook and Google, engineers roll in late and program in Red Bull-fueled marathons all night, but Intel employees get in early and the parking lot is filled before 9 a.m. A late book was once kept in every office, and lallygaggers would have to sign in and explain their tardiness, sometimes with ex-CEO Andy Grove standing watch. We uh, are very aggressive. We set high goals for ourselves. That hard-charging culture is actually taught at Intel. Newcomers enroll in a course called Constructive Confrontation. We have to continually invent new structures and new materials to continue scaling, to continue Moore's Law. So we're always discussing and debating amongst ourselves uh, what new idea is really going to work and have value and can, and can we make it work. To keep up with Moore's Law, Intel has to spend billions of dollars every year and quickly. Since 2009, the company spent $18 billion in technology upgrades and construction. This new fab behind me in Oregon called D1X it costs upwards of $2 billion to complete, and it's not over there. The Intel culture throws big iron at big problems. The spending on gear is staggering. 20 years ago, a billion dollars a year looked like a lot. A decade later, it was $4 billion a year. Last year, $11 billion. So don't be fooled by the sleepy cubicle culture still governing Intel's offices. Even 83-year-old Gordon Moore still keeps a cubicle here. Somewhere in those rows and rows and rows of gray cubicles, someone's planning to throw a billion dollars at the next big problem in technology. It's really a pretty intense, focused effort to uh, understand and develop the very best technology that we can. And speaking with Odalini earlier, he really believes that Intel's culture is changing and has been changing for a long time. I think that's probably true, but I think there are also people at Intel, a lot of people would just tell you there are things about this place that are only Intel. And I think that's true of any com company you work for, where they've got a special way of doing things. Sometimes that way can be very uh, uh, annoying when you want to change the way things go. But the, the heart of the culture of this company really is that Moore's Law and charging hard after that law. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting the way they go and try to change technology by following that uh, inspiration of Gordon Moore. And have to move so quickly in order to do so. Thanks for that, Corey. Coming up, I will be back with more from Intel. We'll have another exclusive interview, this time with Intel's head of mobile. He'll tell us how the chip maker is playing catch up in the mobile market. And from executive to investor to entrepreneur, Reid Hoffman has done it all in Silicon Valley. Bloomberg Game Changers goes behind the scenes with the LinkedIn co founder tonight on a special edition of the program at 9 Eastern and Pacific. Welcome back to Bloomberg West. I'm John Ehrlichman, live at Intel headquarters in Santa Clara, California. As mighty as this company is, it's no secret it's playing catch up in the fast moving mobile market. And the guy who's charged with getting Intel up to speed is Mike Bell, a former Apple VP. Mike, good of you to join us here. Anytime. The boss, Paul Odalidi, was in the hot seat earlier. Uh, the future is in your hands, my friend. Are, I you, love feel, it. are you feeling the pressure? Uh, it's fantastic. It's, uh, it's a good time to be at Intel, and I, I think we're on the right path. Let's go back a step. I mean, it's not as if Intel wasn't investing for the future, making acquisitions with the future in mind to a certain degree. What had been the challenge in this mobile market? You know, I'll be honest, it really, you know, a lot of that really predates my time at Intel. Sure. What, I, what I can tell you is what we've just done over the past year and a half or so is just a renewed focus, a real laser sharp focus on getting our first product out there, making sure it's world class, making sure people love it and then putting together a roadmap that gets better and better over time. So let's talk about that because sure. I've heard it described your team almost like a startup yes. within Intel. Is that right? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have been able to put together a, one of the best phone mobile engineering teams I think on the planet inside of Intel. 
And, uh, you know, it's the best of both worlds. We have a move fast startup kind of mentality with all the resources that Intel brings to bear, including, you know, that technology that people have been talking about that I think is second to none. Well, what I thought was cool is not as, not as if you just thought, what's the best chip for a phone? You said, let's build the phone right. all the way through. Tell us about that. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, I, I'd say... Um, it's, you, you have two approaches when you want to talk to people about phone chips. You can go in with PowerPoint and explain how great it's going to be, right. or you can go in with a, a device and, and really show what's possible. And you know what I've learned over the years is there's nothing like a proof point to really you know drive the point home how great something can be. Well, obviously all this potentially leads to design wins. And what Paulo Delini said earlier is we've had some great announcements so far. The next year will be determined on some of those design wins. What can you tell us about the kinds of design wins you're looking for? <laughs> um, Anything and everything. Uh, probably not a lot. But uh, <laughs> no, I mean we uh, you know we are looking to partner with uh, as many people as we can in the space. We think we have offerings that are, are second to none and even get better over time and you know we've announced some great partners and I think you'll see more to come as the year goes on and certainly an important part of this is getting the developers on board and and everybody thinks about Apple catering to the developers or the Android team or the folks over at Blackberry but very much you have to do the same thing as well well we, we've done two things first you know we have a, a large organization that over the years has already worked with Windows developers to optimize their programs for Windows that same team is working with Android developers today to help us get those Android apps running even better on IA. Um, the other thing, uh, on Intel architecture. Sure. The other thing we've done is, as part of this uh, initial phone launch, we've provided some technology so that even the small percentage of Android apps that were written for another ecosystem run transparently and actually run really well. So we've, we've given a bridge that makes everything pretty much just run, and we're working behind the scenes to make it you know, even better long term. You are a former Apple guy. I am. Is there a possibility that Intel, in a big way, could be partners with Apple in future iPads or iPhones? They've gone their own way so far. <laughs> but is there a possibility of that happening? That was probably a question for Paul. But, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, what, what I will tell you is, um, look, I'd like to have everybody a, as a customer. It's our job to build the best, most compelling products so that people can afford not to at least come look at it. And I think that's what we're on track to do right now. So it's, it's, it's not out of the realm possibility then? Like, like I said, my, my goal is to build something so compelling everyone will have to take a look. The other thing Paul Ludini was talking about was McAfee and how that deal fits yep. into what you're doing with mobile. Tell us very quickly, a little more in depth, what that's all about. Well, it's exciting. And McAfee already has a mobile product that I think uh, you probably heard about that people can download today and it works great on, their, on, their, on our mobile devices. We're also, you know, now that they're part of the Intel family, we're working very closely with them to figure out you know, what we can put in the silicon to make it even easier and better for them to code to and how we just work closer to have a more seamless experience for the user. Gotcha. And just very quickly before we go, is there anything that would make you decide to move away from this to decide, you know what, it's not working out, we're going to go in another direction? No, we, you know, we have the best people, we have the best technology, uh, we just have to execute and, uh, and we're here to do that. What's your favorite phone? My favorite phone is, is our Intel phone. Oh, and, diplomatic uh, guy. Uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great product. Mike, thanks for joining Anytime. us. Anytime. Mike Bell, the head of mobile here at Intel. We're going to come back with our special show here live at Intel headquarters in a couple of minutes, a special BOS bike. for the Be West Bite, a special bite today where we focus on one number that tells a whole lot. And I assume the bite is about Intel today. That is special, isn't it? <laughs> uh, $92,183,201,000. You got it right. That's, that's, a lot, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of money. That's how much money Intel has spent on capital expenditures in 20 years. And they have to spend bids like that in order to keep up, right? Well, look, it's really interesting. And, and you know, you don't want to make this a total, like, we love Intel story. <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a fairly amazing amount of money. And it explains why they have uh, stayed ahead of their competitors in the places they've been focused on for so long. So how does it compare to other companies in technology? Well, th it's always been their edge, you know? It's, it's, to me, this is like the honey I shrunk the kids you know, philosophy, not because I like Rick Moranis, but just because if you were just shrink the kids and leave everything else the same, well, that'd be challenging. They have to go and reinvent the wheel every time, the equipment, and that cost, the, the cost that went into that obviously was their advantage. It's always the about the Canadians with you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be working out for them, at least last year, and they're on track to have another record-breaking year this year. So we will, of course, be following that. Thank you both.
that is it for us today from the Intel Museum. It's a big week for us on Bloomberg West. On Thursday, we're going to have a special edition starting at 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific, as we wait for Facebook to set the price of its IPO. And remember, you can always get all the latest headlines at the top of the hour on Bloomberg Radio all the time on our new tech channel, Bloomberg.com slash technologies. We'll be back in San Francisco tomorrow.